I'm ready, Lisa. Psalmist tells us, you are my God and I will give thanks to you. You are my God and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his loving kindness endures forever. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see everyone this morning. I hope you had a, a really good week and um, thank you for joining us at home. And Monday has announcements for us. birthday to Robert Ripley on the 18th, Katie Eskridge on the 21st, Emily Herman and Jamie Kroge Gardner on the 22nd, and happy anniversary to Dean and Joanne Burkhart on the 19th. Vacation Bible School is this week from 6 to 8.30 for children ages 3 through 6th grade. Let Becky know if you would like to volunteer. You can pre-register your child um, at the website listed in the bulletin, and all are welcome to join. Saturday, August 5th from 9 to 3, and Sunday, August 6th from 12.30 to 4.30, the church will have a yard sale on the front lawn. If it's raining, it'll be held in Pilgrim Hall. Sunday, August 13th at 11 is our outdoor service and potluck picnic at the Lipstown Park. Chicken and beverages will be supplied. Please bring food to share, and feel free to bring your lawn chairs and lawn games, lawn games and friends. The Pet Parade Blessing Contest is on Sunday, September 17th at 1.30. And we have some traveling prayers. Uh, Lisa's son, Nathan, is going to Alaska for a once-in-a-lifetime trip. He is going to be um, fly fishing and backpacking and all the things. So if we can keep him in our prayers. And Lisa and Ken are going to West Virginia if the baby is not born. So they are on baby watch for Nathan and his wife. Brian. Brian and his wife, sorry. <laughs> yeah. It's a little confusing after a while. 
And um, so they'll be going to West Virginia if, if yes, today, right after church, if the, the baby does not arrive. So hopefully the baby doesn't arrive before they get back. So if we can keep Lisa and Ken in our prayers. Do we have anyone else? Continue with morning worship. So there was a man who was driving down this beautiful country road, and he was taking in all the scenery when all of a sudden his car slid on a, a slick spot, and he wound up in the ditch, which was all wet and muddy, so of course the car got stuck. So he walked for a while, and he found a farmhouse and the farmer was out in the field um, plowing with his horse and his, um, his wife and son were in a different field planting seed and so forth. So he went to the farmer and asked if he had a phone that he could call to be pulled out of the ditch. The farmer said, no, I can just unhitch my horse and we can pull you out. And he said, are you sure I can call for help? He said, no, no, no problem. So the farmer and his horse and the man went to the car and the farmer said, I'll hook up the horse you just get in put the car in neutral and um, so the man got in the car and put it in neutral and the farmer got behind the horse and he said okay come on Dusty and come on Matt come on Richard come on Elmer and then the horse starts pulling and easily pulls the car out of the ditch the man got out of the car and he was really surprised he said wow that was really fast that was really good he said but why did you call the horse so many names and he said well Elmer here is blind and he thinks if he has to pull all by himself, he's not going to do anything. <laughs> well, we all know that it's a lot easier to get the work done when we have some extra help to do that. And God always promises to be with us um, in order to make that happen. And so we're going to talk about that today. But let's begin with our call to worship. A word spoken, a voice heard, a dream revealed, a mission received. God calls again and again. God beckons us to follow and to love, to serve, to give. Again and again, God invites us to embrace the lonely, to feed the hungry, to tell the good news of Jesus, to sing songs of praise. And let's sing this joy I have with one verse of this little light of mine.
Let's join our hearts together in our opening prayer and Lord's Prayer. To you, O oh God, who lift up our souls, to you we offer our praise and prayer, our worship and thanksgiving, even in our very lives. Make your ways known to us. Show us the path on which we should walk. Lead us in your truth and teach us. For you alone are the God who saves, the God in whom we trust, and the one on whom we wait, as together we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our psalter responsive reading is Psalm 65, verses 8 through 13. <laughs> Those living far away hear your wonders. Where morning dawns and evening fades, you call forth songs of joy. You care for the land and water it. You enrich it abundantly. The streams of God are filled with water. Provide the people with grain, for so you have ordained it. You drench it its pure furrows and level its ridges. You soften it with showers and bless its crops. You crown the year with your bounty, and your carts overflow with abundance. The grasslands of the desert overflow. The hills are clothed with gladness. The meadows are covered with flocks, and the valleys are mantled with rain. They shout for joy and sing. That's very convenient. I want to sing a song with you called I Want to Be Mud. Uh, it's all about the parable of the sower. And the chorus is really catchy, but you may not know it. So why don't I play that through once slowly, and then each time it comes around, maybe you can join in. Here's how the chorus goes. I want to be mud. I want to be mud. Thick and brown and squidgy and growing. I wanna be mud, I wanna be mud, so the seeds of faith can grow in me. And the whole song goes like this. Jesus told the story of a farmer sowing seeds. Some fell on the stony ground and some fell on the weeds. Some fell on the pathway, but don't let that be you. Cause only the seeds that fell in the mud grew and grew and grew. I wanna be mud. I wanna be mud. Thick and brown and squishy, rolling in God's love. I wanna be mud. I wanna be mud. So the seeds of faith can grow in me. Some people heard what Jesus said, but did not have a clue. The story was about them as well as me and you. Do you do what Jesus says, even when there's trouble near, when there's trouble on the telly, or when no one else can hear? I wanna be mud, I wanna be mud. Thick and brown and squishy, and growing in God's I wanna be mud, I wanna be mud. you want to be, a teacher or a lawyer or a singer on TV, but you can't read the future cause you're not Isaiah's son, so anytime they ask you, 
not sing because it's fun. One last time. I wanna be butter. I wanna be butter. verses 1 through 9 and 18 through 23. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly, but the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. He who has ears, let him hear. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The one who, the one who received the seed that fell on rocky places is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since he has no root, he lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. But the one who received the seed that fell on good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Grace and peace and mercy be unto you from a loving and a merciful God. There was a professor who spent his life helping to um, basically help teachers how to teach. He wanted to help equip teachers so that they would want to stick with teaching. And so he was asked once all those years of working with teachers, what was it that he had learned? And he said, I've learned an important truth that Good teachers are in love with the task of sowing, that they must be enthralled with the task of sowing the seed and be content to leave the harvesting to someone else. He said good teachers spend years sowing seeds, but they hardly ever get to see the harvest. Well, does that relate to your life? Probably all of us in a lot of different ways. It does to mine as a pastor. I believe you know, most fellow pastors would probably believe that you know you cast out good seed but we like teachers don't always get to see the results of the sowing because oftentimes it takes years for the seeds and the words to germinate and to grow and to take root 
Well, one of William Barclay's friends tells this story. He said that in the church where he worshiped, there was an older man named Thomas who always seemed pretty lonely because he had outlived all of his friends and hardly anyone really knew him very well. Um, but when he died, this friend had this feeling that he really needed to go to the funeral service because he didn't want there, want there to be no one there and he didn't think that probably very many people would be there. Um, and so he wanted to be there and when this older man was, was put in his final resting place. And he got there and there was no one else there but the pastor at the, um, at the church. And it was a pretty miserable wet day. And so from the church, they went to the cemetery. And at the gate, though, there was a soldier there that was waiting. And you could tell it was an officer, but he had on his raincoat, so you couldn't really see all of his badges and so forth, so you didn't know what rank he was. So he came to the graveside for the ceremony, and when it was over, he stepped forward and he proceeded to salute. And the man said it was like a salute that you would give to a king. And the friend walked over um, with the soldier and they, as they were walking, the wind kind of blew the soldier's raincoat open and you could see that he was a brigadier general. And the general said, you know, you might be wondering what it is that I'm doing here. And he said, well, Years ago, Thomas was my Sunday school teacher, and he said, I was a pretty wild lad, and I was probably a pretty sore trial to him. And so he never really knew what he did for me, but he said, everything I am and everything I will be as I grow older, I really have to um, give credit to Thomas for casting out those seeds all about and um, you know what became of them and so forth ended up being me and um, so I salute Thomas here. Thomas didn't know that those seeds that he had cast about what would become of them but he cast them out anyway and then you can see some of the things that happened with that. You know sometimes it can seem that the harvest is pretty meager for all the seeds that are thrown out there and we know that really if Jesus is anything that Jesus is really pretty realistic that he knew that there was a lot of waste in the gospel, as there is a lot of waste in life. You know, nature requires more seed to be produced than can ever possibly germinate or come to maturity. You know, when you consider the huge, vast number of animal species that there are out there, and the many colors of flowers and so forth, and all the different kinds of birds who are out there feeding, even just in my own backyard, you can't help but be amazed at the whole variety of nature and the sheer numbers that are out there and the extravagance of the way that the world is put together. You know, with all those colors and so many varieties and species, there's this extravagance and a beauty. But extravagance, if you look at it, is really just another word for waste. You know, there's a lot of waste in nature. There's a lot of waste with love. You know, there's never a one-on-one -on -one return with love, you know, whether it's the love that the creator gives to the creation or the love that's shared between people. You know, most of our best efforts or our most loving acts are wasted, so to speak. You know, well, at least in a sense that they probably go unnoticed, you know, or unheralded by other people. You don't always see immediate results. What do I mean? Well, you know, for instance, if you work really hard, say that, say that you're in some form of customer service and you've taken a lot of time with the customer, making sure that they get what they came for and so forth, your boss isn't going to immediately come up and make you, you know, like person of the year or something. Doesn't rush out there and say, okay, you're employee of the year because you took time with this one person. Maybe you worked really hard on this meal for your family. You know, they're probably not going to pick you up on your shoulders and carry you around the house and cheer you. Woohoo, yay! You know, when you spend that extra hour maybe with your, with your child, maybe, you know, just playing with them or homework or you know, batting practice or carpooling to all those mini events and so forth, no one's going to probably do this heartwarming special on 60 Minutes for you about all that. So you may feel like, well, maybe I just wasted all of that time, you know, nothing really to show for it. However, 
Remember, there's always a however. However, sometimes, you know, in unexpected and in surprising places, those good deeds and growing around those good seeds does end up producing good fruit. Frederick H. Barsh, in his book, Many Things in Parables, he writes this, he said, you know, I dig and I sprinkle seeds, I scratch a little more, I add a bit of new soil, I water, I watch, I wait a week, 10 days. Finally, maybe some scraggly bits of grass appear, but they never seem to grow in those patches the way it should, or I think that they should. Then I look over at the sidewalk, and there's all these tufts of vibrant green grass that are growing up between the cracks and so forth. And I made to think of other times and other places where I've put in lots of effort in those areas that seem largely wasted, while yet in unexpected situations, they flourish. I think it's a lot like that for teachers. You know, most of a teacher's efforts probably seem like they're wasted. You know, most of those lessons taught, all those words that are spoken to the class appear to fall on deaf ears many times. If anything's remembered or recalled years later by the students, rarely does the teacher really know of the harvest that was, that was or those seeds that were planted, and rarely does it seem like the harvest is spectacular. And yet, in all of us, in every single one of us, you know, the, what we do remember from our teachers, it really becomes the very stuff of our lives. You know, I don't remember probably more than one sentence and two whole years of harangues by Mr. Bruce in chemistry and physics class, you know, an hour a day. I had him in class for two years, my junior and senior year. But one sentence stays with me. I remember he'd say to us different times, life is too short not to risk everything and to live boldly. Not stupidly, he'd tell us, but boldly. Risk doing great things. And it usually, of course, came after calling us yahoos because one of us had just done something stupid like putting a snake in his desk drawer or playing ice hockey with the, with the um, dry ice. But this sentence, it, the live boldly and risk doing great things, you know, it sticks with me. Now, have I always done that? Have I always followed that one sentence that Mr. Bruce urged us to do? No, probably not. But I do know that it must have grabbed me by the collar and shook me up and down and made a difference in my 16-year-old life. And we, all of us, in many senses of the word, we're all teachers, you know, we're all teachers to each other, even to ourselves sometimes, but we're teachers to our children, we're teachers to our, our spouses, our sisters, our brothers, our families, our friends, our, our co-workers, even our bosses and so forth. We all teach, we all cast out those seeds of love and wisdom and hope, and, and we hope that somehow they're, they're gonna take root. There's a story told about Jesus. Upon his arrival back to heaven, there was this huge host of angels that greeted him, and um, they asked him, so what did you leave behind on earth to do your work, you know, and help finish the work that you began? And Jesus said, well, I left a, a small group of men and women who loved me. And the angels said, you know, is that it? You know, what if this tiny group should fail? Jesus said, I have no other plans. You see, to Jesus, you know, teaching, the teaching that we do and the work that we do and the seeds of love that we strew about are never insignificant and they're never a waste. You know, only a few seeds really need to germinate in order to produce this whole harvest. Only a, only a small church willing to keep sowing those seeds of love can turn a whole community around. You know, only one lesson or only one sermon needs to be heard in a month of Sundays in order to change a life. Just 12 disciples, think about that. Just 12 disciples, only 11 who finally stayed faithful, and this small group of women were used by Jesus to end up remaking the world. Is it always easy to keep going and to keep sowing and to keep loving when you, when you don't always see the results? Well, you know, of course not. But... Remembering why we do it and remembering who it is that we do it for and who it is that blesses the harvest, you know, that makes all the difference as we leave those, those results into God's hands and we just keep sowing. 
there was a popular movie some years ago that was pretty in, an entertaining film, and it was based on the women's major league baseball team of the 1940s. It was called The League of Their Own. And one of the most really powerful scenes of that movie, the star catcher of the Rockford Peaches, who's played by Gina Davis, she threatens to quit because she's, she's tired and she's just kind of worn out. She's worried about her husband who is out fighting the war. And in this low moment, she says that she was ready to throw in the towel. Well, the, this star catcher, by far one of the best players in the league, complains that the game is just too hard. And the manager of the Rockford Peaches, who's played by Tom Hanks, tries to talk her out of quitting. And when she says it's too hard, he says, well, baseball is supposed to be hard. If it weren't hard, everybody would do it. And then he says, hard is what makes it great. Well, I think you could hear Jesus almost say those same words to us, you know, that, that God calls us to live those that life and cast out those seeds and to plant what is our Christian life. And hard is really what makes it great, you know, and it really is what makes life worth living. So I ask you, is this parable a um, parable of failure or is it a parable of success? Yeah, I think you can really read it either way. It all depends on what it is you're looking for. Unfortunately, sometimes we're better able to see the failures or the waste or the disappointments of, of the seed that seemed to have failed and not taken root and grew, and grew somehow, rather than to see and rejoice in the beauty of the seed that did eventually grow. You know, there are plenty of reasons for why it seems that many seeds don't take root and grow, you know, reasons having to do probably with us, the whole state of the world and so forth. But maybe that just shows us that the miracle is that by the sheer grace of God, there is always a harvest. You know, maybe the miracle is that some seeds do germinate and bear a rich harvest. You know, even if a hundred refuse to hear, fail to bear fruit in their lives, when one person does hear, despite all of the reasons for it not to happen, therein lies the amazing grace of God. You know, the, the sower who never stops sowing. Dr. William Wollman is a United Methodist pastor, and for a long time he was dean of the chapel of um, Duke University, and he tells this story. He says, um, he said, last fall I, I spoke at the college where I graduated from, and after the convocation, this young man came up to me. He said, Dr. Willimon, do you remember me? And um, he said, you know, his face seemed familiar. I, I couldn't recall his name. He said, I'm Rob, and then I remembered. He said he was this little boy in one of my earlier churches. His mother had gone through a pretty difficult divorce, and he said, I remember Rob is often this, you know, sort of rambunctious, pretty unruly child, and yet here he stood before me, you know, this fine-looking young man, and he said, I'm doing great here at Wolford. I, I'm pre-med, and I love it here, and you know, I'm here because of you. And Dr. Willimon said, because of me? And he said, yes, you. He said, I, I first heard about this college from you, and you had such an influence in my life that I wanted to come here. And Dr. Willimon said, you know, how did I make a difference in your life? And as he thought about it, he thought, well, you know, he, he'd been a pretty difficult child, but he was pretty intelligent. So, you know, maybe at this young age, he was influenced by a sermon or maybe the day camp that he conducted for the children in the summer. He thought, you know, what was it that it so influenced his life? And the young man said, you always knew my name. And he said, knew your name? That, that's all? He said, yep, you always knew my name. I never forgot what a good pastor you were. Just remembered his name. That was all. Such this, you know, a small seed just sort of haphazardly sown, unintentionally cast out by a pastor more than a decade ago. And yet, look at the harvest, Dr. Willimon says. You know, as Paul said, I planted... Apollo's water, but God gave the growth. Yeah, of course, it can be difficult to keep sowing those seeds of love when we don't always or maybe, you know, as often see the results as we would like to. And it can feel at times that we're just sort of extravagantly throwing seeds of love here and there. And we might be tempted, you know, to ask for what reason. However, 
You know, when we pause and we remember how graciously and extravagantly God continues to shower us with love, and I'm sure God doesn't always see the results that God thinks that maybe we could give, and yet still continues to shower us generously with love, I think it helps us then to not give up on sowing those seeds ourselves, you know, knowing that it's God who does the work of helping those seeds to grow, and not we all by ourselves. Mother Teresa of Calcutta, um, she died a really well-known figure, did a lot of work with um, children and orphanages, leprosy, and so forth. But nobody ever really would have thought at the beginning of all this that she would have attained any kind of you know, influence when she first began. What did she have to recommend her? Well, she was just this tiny little woman, and um, she began with some pretty meager resources. Mother Teresa told her superiors, I have three pennies, and I have a dream from God to build an orphanage. And her superiors said, Mother Teresa, you can't build an orphanage with three pennies. You know, with three pennies, you can't do anything. And she smiled and said, I know, but with God and three pennies, I can do anything. Well, Mother Teresa, she understood, I think, that principle of the seed, that it takes very little, but that very little blessed by God, and miracles can occur. So don't give up. Keep sowing those seeds of love, blessed by God, working with God, working for God. So may God grant us the courage to continue to plant the seeds of love on every path we try. Amen. And let's sing the first and the third verse of Sweet Hour of Prayer.
Loving God, we thank you for the many gifts that you bless us with each and every day. For daily food and for help, for each breath we take, for our freedom to choose and for the gift of your word, your grace, your mercy, and your love. Our hearts are full and overwhelmed with how much you trust and love us. Help us to always be worthy of that trust. May we always be your people who are unafraid to live as fully and richly as you want us to live. Help us as followers of Jesus to multiply our blessings and to spread your word and your, and your love and to sow those seeds of kindness and acceptance and respect and to do all the good you call us to do. Help us be faithful and worthy of your love and grace. We pray for the church gathered here and around the world that we may be your light and your hope and your love to others. Please bless those who need healing in whatever form healing needs to take place. May you bless all those um, joys and concerns expressed here today, both out loud and in our hearts. All those who need comfort and peace. All those that we know in our hearts need your touch of love. May you bless each one of us, loving God, that we may continue to be a blessing to others in your name. Please walk with us this week and help us to be your light and love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as God has blessed us to continue to spread God's blessings to all that we meet in return, may we continue to thank God for those gifts that we receive as we give up our morning offering.
and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Let's sing together. You are the seed.
Jesus. 